uh, thank you everyone for joining the session today. I hope that you learn a lot from it. Um, I hope everyone can hear me all right. Uh, it's pretty early where I am. I'm joining you all from Chicago, Illinois. Um, so I guess just to introduce myself a little bit more. Uh, so my name is Dr. Julia DeCook. I am a professor, assistant professor in the School of Communication at Loyola University Chicago, which is Chicago's Jesuit Catholic institution. Uh, my research focus is on looking at how to understand um, how extremist groups use the internet uh, to not only build community, but also to understand how they sustain their communities in the face of platform bans and censorship and everything else that we've seen going on, particularly throughout um, the past year, especially, but throughout the past few years about like this whole debate of like, how do we control online hate? Um, my work has also looked at how um, online far right content tends to target youth and so that's kind of going to be the focus of what we talk about today. But it's going to be kind of um, a mixed bag of things that we're going to discuss in this conversation. So I'm going to go over not just kind of a brief history of hate online, but also some recommendations that we've had from people about how best to cover online hate groups, um, but also strategies and uh, recommendations and resources for um, helping to identify someone who's becoming radicalized and what to do when you think radicalization is actually occurring. Um, so hopefully everything works. Um, so as you can all see, um, calling this kind of the infrastructure of hate, so like how online networks are manipulated and exploited by right-wing extremists. Um, as I mentioned before, I'm at the School of Communication at Loyola University of Chicago. And just to begin, um, you know, the internet has afforded us like so many wonderful things. It's given us everything from cat videos to celebrity dogs and the ability to instantaneously connect with anybody in the world. But these same affordances, which communication scholars define as possibilities of action, have also given rise to extremism. So the very same things that allow you to connect with people across the world and to uh, view content and to create content, all of these same things can be done by um, far-right extremists and other nefarious actors. The one thing that a lot of people have paid attention to in recent years in particular is the rise of the alt-right. The rise of the alt-right has often been attributed to the participatory nature of the internet. So what does it mean to be participatory? It means that people no longer just consume media, but actually actively participate and produce it. And so the alt-right is unique from other far-right movements because of their specific use of the internet in order to spread their ideology and to recruit members into their movement. So it is an umbrella term that kind of captures a lot of different um, organizations and groups and ideologies, uh, but the one thing that binds them all together usually is white supremacy. And um, in in Europe, uh, you might not see like so many like specifically like alt right groups per se, but there is the rise of the populist right that has been um, also impacted by similar tactics that the alt right uses in order to recruit and mobilize members. Online white supremacists and extremist groups have been around for quite some time. And so a lot of people seem to uh, have this perception that this is a modern, like a recently modern phenomena. Um, but the fact of the matter is, is that uh, reports started emerging in the mid 1990s calling for a need for um, counterterrorism organizations and like Department of Homeland Security and other, not that didn't exist yet, um, but Department of Defense and other, uh, ministries of defense and everyone else to kind of start paying attention to the way that extremist groups, particularly on the far right, were using the internet. Um, for instance, the most notorious and largest neo-Nazi forum, Stormfront, has been online since 1995 and went kind of like publicly available, like accessible to anyone in 1996. So the extremist right have always been incredibly innovative and early adopters of any new mass communication technology. Um, so what we're seeing right now is the result of decades of planning and kind of biding their time and also um, learning how to use the technologies in the best possible way um, in order to recruit and organize and everything else. And so it's going to take a lot longer to kind of like catch up to where they are because they've been preparing for this moment for much longer. So to call it an infrastructure of hate is probably accurate. So. One big issue that we see with attempts of content moderation of controlling um, online networks and online infrastructure is that the internet and the World Wide Web in particular were founded upon libertarian utopian ideals of free speech and unhindered information networks. So 
kind of the ideology that underpins like web infrastructure and the whole idea of the internet itself is part of the reason why we're in the very situation that we're in when it comes to controlling speech online. Um, basically every single major platform is housed in the United States. So like Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, you know, Google, like these information sources and media networks are American companies that reflect the ideals and ideologies of the people who own and run them. And so um, because of this whole idea of like, you know, they want to create like a space of like just like free internet, they want it to be extremely democratic. They believe in this whole idea of the public sphere they are very reluctant and have been very reluctant in the past to um, engage in any type of censorship or to acknowledge the way that their platforms actually do help spread hateful ideology. Um, so a lot of scholars have noticed that, you know, the very structure of the internet reflects the biases and privileges of the people who created them. Um, namely, these were upper class, uh, successful, successful heterosexual white men um, who, uh, kind of expected all of their privilege to be reflected in online spaces to everyone else. Um, online platforms are extremely poorly regulated and often the work of moderation falls on underpaid and extremely exploited workers. Uh, Sarah Roberts has, ex uh, has explored this in depth in her work behind the screen, which is something that's very um, accessible and very easy to read if anybody is interested in the content moderation industry. Um, also, another huge issue is that these information campaigns um, these, disinf these disinformation campaigns that occur online um, are only possible because of the very structure of the internet itself. So basically what happens is that because algorithms and online platforms privilege um, information that has a potential to go viral, it's very easy to kind of like manipulate online platforms and algorithms and stuff like that in order for messages to spread very quickly and very far. Um, so these very same affordances that allow us to have connection, also these same affordances that allow people to have their content spread far and wide, they're the same things that um, allow far-right extremists to spread their ideologies and online networks. The other thing that is very concerning is that many of these online platforms, particularly Google, and it, it you know Google owns YouTube, is that um, every single one of these platforms allows you to buy advertisements and other types of content that specifically target certain demographics. So that's the reason why that we can see like ads and stuff like that, that match or tend to kind of like closely match the things that we're interested in, right? All of these things are run by algorithms. And so, um, what we're kind of seeing then is that a lot of this content is being targeted to youth, particularly on platforms like YouTube, and particularly toward um, gaming communities and video gaming communities, because it tends to attract a certain demographic of young men, which is exactly who the far right want to target. So these online networks are being manipulated to target um, young men and teenagers, especially. Uh, this is a meme that emerged um, in the, a couple years ago, but basically it's the whole idea that, um, you know, gamers let fascism happen to you. Uh, the more, I don't know if any of you have ever done this, but basically um, if you go on YouTube and you start looking at like gaming videos, you if you leave on the autoplay feature to show you like recommended or related videos, it will almost always within, anywhere from like three to six videos start showing you extremist content. Um, and so, you know, I know a lot of you may know um, like children or young people in your life, or uh, at least like um, have your own children or young people in your life that use and watch YouTube quite frequently. And if they're watching gaming videos, it is almost guaranteed that they have been exposed to extremist content. Um, but even if they're not watching gaming videos, YouTube, YouTube's algorithm will often recommend um, extremist content to people because it's what's trending. So they're very, very good at harnessing the um, the things that make videos trend to the the things that make them go viral, the thing that the things that um, help videos like get pushed to the top of search pages and everything else. Um, 
on YouTube as well as other platforms like Facebook groups, Google search, everything else. Um, so the other thing that we have to remember is that the alt-right also harnessed um, the tactics and the power of a previous movement um, called Gamergate, which was a really, really impactful and very, um, very dangerous harassment campaign that was leveled towards um, women in gaming as not just gamers, but also in the gaming industry and in gaming journalism. Um, and the same kind of like networks and like even like celebrities and stuff that emerged during the Gamergate um, harassment scandal, um, a lot of them actually ended up also becoming celebrities and networks that helped with the rise of the alt-right. As we kind of talk about is that algorithms are extremely easily manipulated and exploited and online recruitment and mobilization um, strategies by the extremist right use methods typical of that of internet influencers. They'll do the same thing of using hashtags. Um, they'll, you know, uh, use things like search engine optimization where they'll make sure that their um, results come to the top of the page. They know how to exploit like the way that algorithms view things like clicks and likes and views. Um, and research has shown that algorithms on major search engines, Google specifically, and other platforms are racist, sexist, and classist. Um, Safia Noble found this in her work, Algorithms of Oppression, where when you search for um, white girls, you're shown uh, pictures of young white girls, children. Um, but when you search for like black girls or Asian girls, you're shown pornography. Although Google has fixed this algorithm for black girls, if you still search Asian girls or Latina girls, you're still shown pornography. Um, and so we kind of see the ways that like the, the ideologies and belief systems and um, the way that like a Google search can actually be manipulated as well um, to show these types of results um, kind of plays out with just that one example. But one thing to note is that it's not, radicalization is far more complex than, you know, a young person saw a bunch of videos and has become radicalized. Rather, what we see often is that um, many people who become more radicalized into extremist groups were already slightly radicalized before coming across this content. It's not like a zero to 60 kind of situation. It's more like a like 10 to 20 to 60 kind of thing. Um, radicalization is not a process that happens alone. Like radicalization is a group process. And so um, often a lot of people who become radicalized become so because of their social networks. What's happening though is that these social networks also exist online and are far more easily accessible. The example that we can use for um, people already being radicalized before being shown extremist content online is Dylan Roof. So Dylan Roof, for those of you who may be unfamiliar, was a young man who shot and killed nine black people at a church in South Carolina. Dylan Roof had already been quite radicalized before he entered that church and murdered those people. Um, but when he searched in Google black on black crime, um, the results that were shown to him were from extremist websites. So he was already slightly radicalized to have to search that term, right? To know what that term was, to be curious about it. But because of all the results being shown to him being extremist content, he just fell further into this radicalization rabbit hole and became um, emboldened to carry out this attack. Online platforms have helped to facilitate a significant Political, motive, uh, political mobilization and social movements, as, we, as we've seen throughout the world. Um, things like the Arab Spring and all these other movements that we've seen um, since then have shown that online platforms have the potential to help people organize, but they are very limited in their potential and effectiveness. And rather than like leveling the playing field where everybody is able to engage in these kind of like democratic processes, online politics often mirrors offline politics and that it favors the rich and powerful because they're the ones able to buy all of the advertisement, all of the search engine optimization to um, use a lot of money to help produce like very impressive YouTube videos and content and everything else, right? All of that takes time and effort and money. And so um, 
Jen Shradi, who uh, wrote the book, The Revolution That Wasn't, like noted that um, online social movements and networks and stuff like mirror offline politics and that conservative groups have the upper hand when it comes to online um, politics and also and helping to mobilize and organize these groups. So where do these hate groups tend to live? So famous places where they've congregated include places like Reddit and 4chan, which many of you may be familiar with. Um, 8chan, which is now 8kun, um, emerged after 4chan finally started doing some level of content moderation. Um, in Germany, we have Colchan, um, Stormfront, which we've mentioned before. Incels.co is specifically catered towards um, the incels subculture and movement. Um, 55 Chan is popular in Brazil. Um, Hispachan is a Spanish language one. And there's so much more that I barely even scratched the surface of this. Every single country, every single community um, that exists online, there's there's a specific kind of like 4chan-esque community for that country. So you may be more familiar with the ones in yours. I'm sorry, I don't know. I only speak two languages. Uh, so I'm only familiar with the ones that I've seen in my own research as well as in research of my colleagues. So again, a lot of these groups are specifically targeting youth because if you target youth, you have, and you get them into your fold, you're more likely to have a loyal kind of like member of your group, right? And also too, youth is a very complicated time, particularly when you're a teenager. Um, if, and transitioning from being a teenager to being a young adult. Um, you know, those years between, um, you know, being roughly 18, 19 years old to about your mid twenties um, are very confusing and very tumultuous time in many people's lives. Um, there's a lot of uncertainty. There's a lot of uh, like painful growth that you go through. Like all of us are familiar with this. However, that uncertainty and that loneliness and that, um, that anxiety around like who you're going to be and who you're going to become and where you belong are things that far right groups are very good at exploiting among youth. Um, and so, uh, although social like radicalization does happen um, in social groups, um, if someone is perhaps like feeling lonely or wanting to like you know make connection or to like do something more with their life beyond what they've done so far like these kind of organizations can be really really appealing and so a lot almost every single platform and every single organization specifically targets youth uh, for this very reason we've seen this with things like identity europa or um you know turning point usa is a really big one that specifically targets university students um Proud Boys is an organization that specifically targets young men. Um, and we see this kind of like being repeated over and over again, that their focus is on youth, um, not just young men, but also young women. And so when we look at young women as well, like there is like a hyper focus on trying to get young women into these organizations too, um, for kind of a twofold reason. Uh, one thing that white supremacists um, are really, really kind of almost obsessed with is you know, of course, the continuation of the white race. Um, and so obviously, they encourage women, white women to get married and have children in order to make sure that they are able to continue the white race, which they use things like, you know, xenophobia and like fear of immigrants and Islamophobia and stuff to kind of stoke in people. Um, but white women and young white women are also extremely complicit in spreading the messages of the far right. We see so many um, young men, young women, within these movements who have the same celebrity status as the men, um, who have their own YouTube channels, who have like significant online communities and following. And so we can't just think of this as like a young white men issue. It's also the women who are also becoming very involved and have always been involved um, in the white supremacist movement. So there are some really great resources that exist for organizations and parents and schools and helping prevent youth radicalization by far right extremists and political parties. Um, a, a couple that I found were particularly helpful and had some of the best information that was very well packaged and kind of organized and stuff was Educate Against Hate as well as Extreme Dialogue. Um, Educate Against Hate, I believe, is UK based. And they have resources not just for parents, but for schools and for like, you know, school administrators and, you know, people who work in schools as well. Um, 
and like uh, workshops and posters and like a bunch of stuff that you can use um, uh, depending on the needs of your organization. Um, extreme dialogue, of course, focuses on teaching people like, you know, dialogue and conversation skills about how to approach these conversations because it can be kind of uncomfortable, right? Um, and so uh, they provide a lot of resources on like, you know, how to have the conversation with someone that you believe may be becoming radicalized or know has become radicalized. And then there's also a really great report by Demos, the think tank and policy center um, called Digital Citizens, which um, countering online extremism, which I can share a quick link with you in the chat. Um, I actually have this document on um, resources on online far-right extremism, which I'll share with you all in the chat. It's just taking a minute to load. So here's a quick, um, it's a very short document that gives you resources, not just on um, the ones that I've mentioned here so far, but also um, like general information and reading to kind of understand um, the crux of the issue. But another big problem that we tend to kind of run into is analyzing the forums themselves. A lot of people are very reluctant to even go to these websites because of the reputations that they have. And because they do have a lot of really extreme or sensitive or very like uncomfortable content, like everything ranging from, um, you know, gore. So like, you know, very bloody, very like violent images or videos to pornography, to far right content, to everything. Um, but the thing that makes it really, really difficult in analyzing these forums and researching them is that many members of these forums are extremely aware of the fact that they are being watched. So they know that their program is notorious and has a lot of infamy and that they're constantly being watched by, you know, curious members of the public, by law enforcement, by journalists, by researchers, by people who are in a nonprofit organization, everything. So they will intentionally often post fake content and threats to trick observers because they think it's funny. Um, they'll do this as a joke. And so there are some best practices, which I included links to in the resources document, but also which I'll just really briefly outline here for those of us, for those of you who are following along. So working with extremist content, um, a really good first step is to ask very basic media literacy questions. So as a communication scholar, a really big thing that we advocate for is media literacy. So, you know, what is the message for and who made it? What technique? what techniques are being used to capture people's attention, um, how might different people interpret this message differently, um, what kinds of values or beliefs are being represented, represented and why is this message being sent? Um, you know, these very basic questions are actually also very good in working with youth when it comes to helping them analyze media messages that they see, um, but particularly when they're being shown extremist content. And so being able to kind of like critically look at and like analyze the content together is a really good kind of like first step in instilling this kind of like behavior um, when they're coming across extremist content online or when they're being shown it because they are being targeted. So some best tips often tend to kind of like fall more towards the realm of like journalism. Um, but I think the, the things that they recommend for journalists also still apply to um, researchers or uh, people who work in organizations and everything else um, in ways that like still affect the way that we, the public understands these groups. Um, so uh, Joan Donovan and Jesse Daniels, who are both very prominent researchers of disinformation in the far right online, um, had these tips, which is included in the resource document. Um, you know, be aware that journalists and ignorance of some research groups plays a role in white supremacists and extremists spreading their message. Um, we saw this with a, with a lot of media coverage about them and a lot of news organizations and even researchers and think tanks and stuff um, kind of just like took what white supremacist organizations and stuff were kind of saying at face value and helped them to even amplify their message by like interviewing them and like featuring them in like news stories and like everything else, right? Um, another very important tip that they recommend, which is extremely crucial, is to investigate the funding sources of white supremacy and white wing extreme and right wing extremism. Um, like I mentioned earlier, like they're very well funded 
And so trying to find, kind of figure out like where is the money coming from, like following this paper trail is a very important way of understanding like who exactly is behind this messaging. Don't portray race-based extremism or racism in politics as new. Um, avoid letting white supremacists use their own terms to describe themselves. So call them what they are instead of like them saying, for example, Identity Europa for a very long time just insisted that they were just proud European youth, um, but they're white supremacists. Um, consider taking a stance on strategic silence. So strategic silence is something that Donovan has advocated for for quite some time, especially for news organizations or people who produce a lot of public facing content. Um, in that like if something happens to make the decision to not cover it to like not you know um, talk about it on your social media channels to not release it on any other platform because what they want is attention um, and that's not to say that like you know completely ignoring that will make the problem go away but what we're seeing with like um, the rise of the alt-right and all these other extremist groups is that they really thrive on the media attention that they receive. And so sometimes like consider taking a stance on strategic silence, especially when a very violent attack of happens um, is sometimes the best strategy. If you do speak to members and extremist groups, um, always record interactions with them. Um, always paraphrase what they say. So never just repeat what they say verbatim, but rather um, change some things. Be aware of the role of technology in amplifying racist messages, which is what we're doing here today. Um, familiarize yourself with organizations that already work with racial and religious minorities within your communities. Um, often they have a lot of really great tips on how to work with extremists because they are often the ones being targeted by extremist groups, right? Um, and of course, you know, something that we've talked about is that, you know, white supremacists and these organizations like often want notoriety they want the attention. And so by not giving it to them, that's also a strategy in helping to mitigate their influence in our society. Pointer, which is a really prominent um, journalism organization in the United States, uh, specifically had tips for covering 4chan. Um, so these very quick six tips for looking at 4chan, especially because it's a website that is very confusing and very broad. and everyone is anonymous and sometimes nothing makes sense um remember many people are in it for the lulls um so they're in it for the jokes they're in it for the humor of it so they will sometimes intentionally post fake content to bait people who aren't members of the community um another very very important thing to do on websites like 4chan or like vast forums and stuff is that you have to spend a significant amount of time within the forum in order to identify which boards will be the most helpful. So there's multiple boards and communities within communities like 4chan and 8 and others. And so spending some time in the boards um, will not only help you to identify which ones are the most helpful, but also, um, and tip number five, you know, if you spend time in the boards you're choosing to cover, you start learning kind of like the language used in that board, uh, you start learning kind of like the the memes that they use, you start learning about um, like the the specific kind of like culture of the board that they have that may or may not like impact whether you choose to cover it or whether you choose to use it in order to kind of understand how radicalization is occurring. Um, be skeptical about everything. Um, again, with the thing with like strategic silence, you know, be very choosy and selective about what you choose to cover. And another thing that you can always do, especially when you're talking about these groups to like, you know, um like stakeholder or their parents or anyone else um is that you can get meta with it so what does this mean so instead of kind of like talking about specific posts or communities or anything else you can kind of um give your own kind of like uh paraphrase or kind of like version of events within that forum um which don't necessarily like uh, reflect specifically what you found um and everything else this resource is also in the resources document that I shared with you all. A lot of people ask, you know, can't we just ban them? Um, and unfortunately, it's actually far more complex than that. Um, you know, banning and deplatforming is effective, but a very limited short term solution for halting the spread of extremism. Um, what I found in my own um, 
doctoral dissertation um, is that, sorry, I had to sneeze, um, is that um, these groups are extremely adept at navigating the constraints of digital platforms and they're, excuse me, uh, and they're often able to exploit and maneuver around these constraints of like bans and deplatforming and stuff because of how deeply familiar they are with navigating the online um, and how to uh, uh, navigate and like their familiarity with the logic of digital infrastructure. And so before the threat of bans, they like, you know, they archive all of their content, they like move somewhere else. Um, and then they reemerge by going into private channels like, um, the very popular instant messaging application Discord or even Slack, um, because then like they're not privy to like the moderation of a public facing platform. But another thing that they also tend to do too is that, uh, for instance, there are very strict rules in Germany about what constitutes hate speech, and so a lot of like German far right forums will host their websites in other countries. It's just something that anybody can do very easily that don't have those rules on hate speech. And so they're able to kind of like get around even that law. Another thing that they also do is that they hide their language, right? They'll use like certain acronyms or like certain numbers or even like um, like images and stuff like that to like hide what they're actually trying to say. And so that's a very, very uh, common method among the far right in order to make sure that like not only can they be censored, but also a regular person who is not familiar with that language can't detect what's going on. Of course, all of you are here because of the concerns surrounding far-right extremism. Far-right attacks in the West have surged by 320% in the last five years. Um, this is from the Global Terrorism Index report from 2019. Um, the rise of the far right groups, which the internet has not caused, but has absolutely helped to um, facilitate, has translated into real life violence that overwhelmingly targets marginalized communities. Um, multiple reports from organizations like the Anti Defamation League in, in the US, as well as Southern Poverty Law Center and like other organizations across the world, have noted the rise in far right extremism. Um, and so, uh, Obviously, this is a very, very important issue. This trend is only going to continue. Um, and now it's more urgent than ever to kind of help like work on these uh, programs to help de-radicalize and to stop the spread of extremist content online and to work within our own communities to combat like the creep of fascism. All right, thank you all so much. Um, I guess we have enough time to uh, I kind of just open it up for Q&A and if we have enough time after that or if people are interested, we can also look at a few far right memes. I know that's probably not like the thing that anybody really wants to do, uh, but it's an option that we have. Um, so I also have this long list of the citations that I use within um, the presentation itself. If anybody kind of wants to take um, a quick picture of it or something uh, for reading later um, for yourself or for your organization, um, that might be helpful. I can also paste these citations um, into the resources document, which might actually be a better thing to do. So Diana asked, what platform is the biggest hook for teens to become radicalized? Um, I would honestly say YouTube. YouTube is absolutely one of the biggest platforms that youth are becoming radicalized on. So it's not websites like Reddit and 4chan and stuff like that where we're seeing this happen. Of course, we're seeing it happen in those spaces, but for youth and teens specifically, the biggest hook is absolutely YouTube and kind of like gaming communities and like Discord, which is like an instant messaging application and stuff like that. Um, all right, and then also being asked, um, can I recommend some tools to analyze uh, social media accounts some web scrapers for Twitter or Facebook. So Facebook has a famously very closed API. Um, the one thing that you can use to analyze Facebook um, or collect data from it is a tool called CrowdTangle, um, but it costs a lot of money. It's not just like openly available to anybody. Um, and so because, because of what happened with um, Cambridge Analytica, Facebook closed everything. And Facebook has been also very notorious ever since its inception by, 
um, not allowing researchers to analyze data from its platform. Um, so for Facebook, there's pretty much nothing except for CrowdTangle. Yeah, CrowdTangle for big companies, but there's like basically nothing for like just researchers who don't have the money to do it. Um, for Twitter, there used to be a lot more tools, but the problem with Twitter is that um, that basically uh, you can no longer collect historical tweets. So you can only collect things like as they happen. So um, some very easy things that you can use for Twitter are things like tags, um, which is probably one of the easiest things to use, um, uh, as well as a few other, um, like if you, any of you are familiar with R or R Studio, like they, they have um, scripts available online for uh, collecting data from Twitter. I hope that answers your question. Um, Instagram used to have a pretty open API, which is what I collected data from when I did um, my project on looking at memes on Instagram and how they target youth. But because of Cambridge Analytica and Facebook owns Instagram, they also kind of closed down the Instagram API, making it harder to access. Um, is the rise of the right wing and alt right more a thing of the Western world? It seems that we don't see so much of this on the East. Um, populism is absolutely a problem worldwide. Um, if we look at places like India, for instance, the rise of Hindu nationalism is driven by populist politics. Um, and we're seeing this in a lot of other countries as well, where populist leaders are taking power. We're seeing this in Turkey, for instance, with Erdogan. Um, so it is absolutely a problem in the East, but um, it's, it, it probably wouldn't be considered necessarily like alt right, but it is still kind of right wing. Um, so there is a difference between, you know, white supremacy and like right wing extremism. Um, so like Hindu nationalism, for instance, is absolutely right wing, but it probably wouldn't be called white supremacist. And so this is happening worldwide. Um, for instance, in Japan too, there's been the Neto Ayuku for a very long time, like, Japanese far right extremists um, have existed for decades uh, and have often been the inspiration for some far right extremist groups in the West. And so these organizations and ideologies and beliefs absolutely exist in the East. Um, what are the necessary steps that need to be taken to decrease the impact of far right groups? It's really complicated. Um, people are still kind of trying to figure that out. Um, so kind of the first step that a lot of people tend to be kind of moving towards is trying to at least lessen their influence on online networks. Um, for instance, um, there's uh, this movement in the US called like Stop Hate for Profit where they've like implored big corporations who spend a lot of money on advertising to pull their advertising from extremist websites and like extremist television shows and like, um, and you know, major platforms are starting to ban a lot of these, like you know, right wing media kind of things. Um, Facebook just recently announced yesterday that they're finally going to start banning Holocaust denial on their platform. Um, you know, they just recently banned like QAnon and like militia groups and stuff. So like these are kind of like the big first steps that people are taking. But um, in terms of like how do you stop like radicalization and like your face-to-face -face community, like that kind of stuff I'm a little bit less familiar with, but there are organizations like um, that help people like get out of extremist groups. Like I know in the United States, there's a group called like Life After Hate, um, where they help people who are looking to get out of extremist organizations, like transition back into um, society and stuff like that. And so it's, there's a lot of different approaches, right? Um, and so, it's a, lot, a little bit more complicated than just like, what are the necessary steps? What the necessary step is, is that we have to eradicate like white supremacism and like xenophobia and persecution of religious minorities and stuff in our societies. Um, but that's gonna be far more complex. All right, how effective are counter narrative voices and influencers in combating online radicalization? That's actually really unknown. Because often, uh, for instance, like there are a lot of like left wing YouTubers, they call themselves BreadTube, that kind of like network of people. But the problem is, is that they're not as well funded as right wing YouTubers. And so they can't do it long term or they don't have the same like production value for their videos and stuff. Um, you know, they can't like do it full time like a lot of right wing YouTubers do. And so they like they are kind of like 
sort of effective, but it's like it's really hard to say because there's no research on how effective they are because they don't stick around for as long or don't attract like the same kind of like audience and stuff like that. And so, you know, there's there are a few people who are very popular, but like there's only maybe, you know, four to five of them. Whereas on the right wing YouTube ecosystem, there's so many more. And so it's almost a problem of just like, you know, sheer numbers. Um, so it's it's difficult to kind of understand like if counter narrative voices are effective in combating online radicalization. Um, so what is the global lingua franca for the far right groups to communicate? If it's in English, do you see this changing in the future? Also, what impact can language have on the spread of far right material? So, you know, English is used very often, especially because it is a language most often used in forums like Reddit and 4chan and stuff. But that's not to say that they don't not act like, you know, um, like communicate in other languages. Like, you know, Germany has its own version of 4chan. Brazil has its own version of 4chan. Um, you know, 4chan started because of Japanese 2chan. That was the original one. And so like, you know, all of these like far right groups have their own communities that congregate in. Um, so like, it's hard to determine like if they, if there is a lot of cross pollinization, like I think that's like still sort of uncertain. Um, but you know, in the Anglophone world, like obviously English is the um, way that they communicate. I don't really see anything really changing in the future because even 4chan they have like language specific and like country specific boards where people communicate in languages other than english um so like language specifically is extremely impactful in the spread of far-right material um because of the way that people can use language to not just like you know hide their true meaning but also because of like the kind of like fear and anxiety that people can cause through their rhetoric and so language is an essential part of propaganda and so of course it's an essential part of far right material um yeah um i don't want to butcher your name um katarzyna i'm sorry if i mispronounced that <laughs> but you know you make uh, you know you make the point that like you know anti-abortion activists have so much more money for their disinformation campaigns and stuff like people just simply cannot keep up i think that's a really great example so um, thank you for that. So the similar thing is happening with like attempts for counter narratives on the left. Um, and, you know, anti-abortion is kind of caught up in like a, the larger like far right movement, right? It's Christian conservatism, and evangelical Christianity, which often marries itself to far right extremism. So any other questions or, and yeah, and COVID-19 now as well, like, oh my God, like COVID-19 has been like a blessing for these groups. Um, can gamers on YouTube be considered promoters of the alt-right? Not all gamers, some absolutely yes. Um, for instance, like uh, Sargon of Akkad is absolutely a promoter of the alt-right. He had a gaming channel. He was a very big figure in Gamergate. PewDiePie has come under fire multiple times for like, you know, using racial slurs in his streams for, he actually put on a Ku Klux Klan uniform during one of his streams. Um, he has like said very anti-Semitic things in his streams. Like, so even though he may not specifically be alt-right, like he has kind of alluded to that he is familiar with these cultures and their language and stuff. Even the Christchurch shooter at the end of his um, like murder stream said, subscribe to PewDiePie. So, PewDiePie is also kind of like, you know, implicated within this larger um, sphere because like he has never outright like denounced white supremacy and has often kind of like made jokes out of it too with like, you know, saying like racial and anti-Semitic slurs or like claiming he accidentally put on like a KKK uniform um, and stuff like that. So there are a few um, prominent gaming YouTubers who can be considered to be promoters of the far right because of the kind of beliefs that they share on their channels and stuff like that. Yeah, and um, like uh, I, I, Katarzyna makes the point that uh, it's not just YouTube, but they prepare tons of websites with great search engine optimization um, that like all of their results are pushed to the top of the front page um, and you know, the average user, like you point out, like they don't go past even like page two of search results on Google often. And so, um, 
we're seeing this happening not just on YouTube, but even just on places like Google. Uh, so the example that I use of Dylan Roof, that's exactly what happened to him is that he searched for something that is known to be kind of this like white supremacist trope of like black on black crime. And all of the websites he was shown on the first page were from white supremacist far right websites. Um, and then on top of that too, another thing that they're very good at doing is something called cloaking, like a cloak, um, where they hide who is actually running the website. And they're really good at like basically like making the website look very legitimate because it's so easy now. Like anybody can make like a pretty decent looking website. Um, and so like they spread all this content on websites that people believe are like real websites. This is happening with like anti-vaccination, with like anti-abortion, with like far right groups. It's happening in a lot of different areas. Um, how will this phenomenon be affected by the US elections? Have we passed the point of no return? I can't say, I have no idea. I live here and I'm freaking terrified, um, but I'm still hopeful. So I have I have no idea. That's a, that's a question that I just simply cannot answer. Um, how to differentiate between distasteful joke and full on propaganda. Uh, many gamer YouTubers jokingly say a lot of things, but at the same time, someone inclined to the right can easily understand it as something really serious. That's a really, really good question because sometimes it's really difficult to tell what is kind of like a distasteful, like edgy kind of like internet culture joke versus full on propaganda. Um, but the thing is, we have to understand these jokes like as a form of propaganda because think about young kids watching this they learn that these jokes are funny. So eventually they might actually start believing them. Um, so it's, it's like that whole thing of like, there's like a kernel of truth in every like falsehood or every joke. And I think like we have to kind of like take that seriously. Um, and so also too, it's like the example that I use with PewDiePie, like he claims that they were just like very poorly informed jokes, but the thing is, like, he's also never openly denounced the organizations and stuff like that. So it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's hard to tell, which is why, like, you know, websites like 4chan and Reddit are really hard to analyze, because sometimes they will intentionally make things difficult um, to tell how serious they are, and stuff like that. Um, did officials start to label white supremacy groups as terrorists? And this is an effective measure. Some yes, others no. Um, I was very surprised because in the US, there's been kind of this like reluctance, like they've been very like apprehensive about calling it specifically terrorism. But the Department of Homeland Security just released a report a couple days ago where they specifically named white supremacist um, terrorism as like a growing threat. So that was interesting. Um, I don't know if that's an effective measure or not. I don't work in terrorism um, or anything like that. And so like, I'm not sure if it will be particularly effective in combating like these groups. Um, it might allow for more like revenue streams to appear, like people can get grants and stuff like that if they're starting these organizations. But I can't say whether or not it's truly effective in helping to kind of like stop um, the spread of like domestic terrorism, especially. I guess I can just really quickly share uh, one thing that, you know, communication scholars like really advocate for is more kind of like media and like digital literacy. And so um, this is like targeted just kind of more towards like media literacy, like in general, but here is like just a, a quick kind of like resource on like how to teach like media literacy to children. Um, if anybody's interested in that, if their organization works in that at all, um, and like kind of like tailoring it specifically like white supremacist messages might be something that some of you may be interested in. Um, oh, we do have a question. Um, how much of these phenomena are organic and how much of it is targeted propaganda? For example, have anti-abortion and COVID denying narratives been intentionally adopted by the far right, or was it a natural process due to similar thought patterns? It's both. Um, so I think that's what makes it really, really hard to control because it's a combination of kind of like organic, like grassroots type of stuff, but it also is, uh, related to like targeted funded, like astroturfed, like propaganda. Um, so, uh, like 
anti-abortion and like COVID denying narratives have been intentionally adopted by the far right. Um, but the thing is like, it was simultaneously kind of a natural process, but also something that was like pushed by certain organizations. So I don't know if you all saw this, but there were some really big protests in the States, um, uh, like in Michigan in particular, like against like lockdown measures and like wearing masks and stuff like that. Uh, many of you may have seen the image of like armed protesters entering like the state government building. Um, that people like that was like kind of like marketed as like something that was like that happened organically it was a grassroots movement but when people actually followed the money of who was organizing these protests it was an organization that has been notoriously like involved in pushing like far-right politics in the state of michigan very well funded and um actually like linked to betsy devos like the extremely wealthy secretary of education from the state of michigan and so it's really easy to kind of like follow these paper trails and almost always a lot of like far right movements like are being funded by someone, particularly in the US that's often been the case, but that's not to say that these phenomena aren't organic. It's a combination of both. <laughs>